Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Monday, June 13th. And tonight, we're talking about the January 6th hearings. After the president tweeted at me by name, the threats became much more specific, much more graphic. Today, the committee focused on the big lie and the online threats it motivated. How will the group connect all that to the attack on the Capitol? A bipartisan deal for gun violence legislation is coming together in Congress. What's in it? And will it work? Also, a group of men faces charges for allegedly targeting a pride event in Idaho. We'll get into why extremist groups are targeting the LGBTQ community and what might be done about it. Plus, Sarah Palin is one step closer to a political comeback. We'll update you on this weekend's primary elections in Alaska. So the attack on the Capitol was about the 2020 election and President Trump's unwillingness to accept defeat. Today, the January 6th committee dissected the conspiracy theory he used to explain that defeat, the big lie. This morning, we'll tell the story of how Donald Trump lost an election and knew he lost an election and as a result of his loss, decided to wage an attack on our democracy. Rather than accept the results of the election and the decisions of the courts, Mr. Trump pursued a different strategy. He tried to convince the American people the election had been stolen. Many of his supporters believed him, and many still believe him today. The committee also released more testimony from the former president's inner circle. Much of that focused on his attorney general, Bill Barr. Right out of the box on election night, the president uh, claimed that there was major fraud underway. I mean, this happened, as far as I could tell, before there was actually any potential of looking at evidence. I was somewhat demoralized because I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. Today's hearing also included recorded testimony from former Trump campaign manager Bill Stepien. He would have testified in person, but his wife had gone into labor. The in-person witnesses included Chris Steyerwalt, the former political editor at Fox News. Fox was the first network to call Arizona for Joe Biden on election night. The committee asked him if he saw any path to victory for the Trump campaign after the Arizona call. His answer? None. Also, former Philadelphia City Commissioner Al Schmidt, a Republican, testified today. He investigated the president's claim that ballots in Philly were cast in the names of dead people. Mr. Schmidt told the panel he found no proof of that. But that prompted a tweet from the former president calling him a Republican in name only, a rhino. Schmidt says that was when things got scary. After the president tweeted at me by name, calling me out the way that he did, um, the threats became much more specific, much more graphic, uh, and included not just me by name, uh, but included members of my family by name, their ages, our address, pictures of our home, just every bit of detail that you could imagine. That was what changed with that tweet. Let's dig into the hearing with NBC Washington correspondent Yamin Shal Sindor and legal analyst Danny Savalos. Good to have you both here. And Danny, let me just start with you and level set for the hearing. We've said this before. I think it bears saying again, this felt very prosecutorial, but no one is on trial here. This is a different kind of process. Exactly right. And if I were to be specific, it would be more like a grand jury proceeding where it's a one-sided show. It is all the prosecution. Defense attorneys aren't even allowed in the room. So we're really only hearing one side of the story, but what a side it was. And I think it was geared towards people who maybe had looked at headlines from time to time, but didn't really normally have the time to put together their own summary. Here, the, the committee did it for them in easy to watch uh, clips, deposition clips, segments, and they really produced it almost like a music video. I mean, it had a, it hit a crescendo, it moved on with a pace, 
Normally, depositions, long, boring, drawn out. They took the greatest hits, and they played them in a pretty well choreographed uh, presentation. You mean, I felt like there was something to this that sort of painted a different picture of the orbit around the former president. I think before this hearing, it would have been easy to assume that everyone around the president's orbit was kind of fomenting the same things that he was saying and just kind of propping him up. This hearing today created a distinction, kind of an inner circle, outer circle, and the people who found themselves in the outer circle were the ones who were trying to tell the former president the truth. Certainly. And what we saw really was the black box at the White House on election night really opened up. We heard from people who were there when President, when former President Trump um, made the decision to do what no U.S. president had done before him, which was declare victory when he had not, in fact, won the election. And I think it's very important that you point out that there was this sort of inner circle. And I, I, there's an inner circle and an outer circle. That's one way you could put it. But there's also this shrinking inner circle and a, and a former President Trump becoming more and more isolated the deeper he got into this lie. We heard from um, Attorney General Bill Barr, who said that he had to tell the president the Department of Justice cannot take sides in elections, and that he essentially decided to resign because President Trump, before the election, was someone that he could argue with. But after the election, he became someone who would not listen to anyone, including his cabinet secretary, someone who was unhinged. We also heard, of course, from Bill Sepian, who said that he was also in the trenches trying to make sure that President Trump would become the next president and would be able to hold on to power. Um, but then he said that things just didn't look honest and professional after a while. And as a result, he stepped away. You also heard Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, say, I told the president, former President Trump, this is not the approach that you should be taking. And President Trump wrote back and or said back to him that I have confidence in Rudy Giuliani. And it's also, of course, interesting that these advisors are saying that former President Trump was taking advice from an inebriated, apparently inebriated Rudy Giuliani instead of taking advice from the people who knew best that the election had not been won by him. One of the people we see on that list there on the screen now in panel two, B.J. Pack, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia, that's the Atlanta area. And Danny, it feels like the nature of this hearing, just by virtue of the fact that they're talking to attorneys who, you know, have bar associations to deal with and who know now is not the time to bend the truth, it puts a whole different spin on it in a way, especially because the committee is trying to lay out a fact pattern which may or may not lead to other charges, prosecutions down the line. As you said, this is all prosecution, no defense, but it would sound like they built the witness list to be as bulletproof as possible. They did, and probably the only criticism I would have is that they didn't have enough time with each witness, and B.J. Pack is at the top of my list. I read his entire de his transcript of his interview before his testimony today, and he has quite a story to tell. And in my mind today, he was potentially the most important witness because you could argue that the others were really just expert opinion type witnesses. You have an election lawyer, somebody who knows elections better than anybody who concludes that Donald Trump lost the election. Well, okay, that's his opinion, but B.J. Pack was there. He was there on the ground floor. He was somebody who was pressured to leave his office, resign, or you're going to be fired the next day. Why? Well, because you're a never-Trumper and you're not carrying out this mission, which is a ridiculous mission. It, to use a paraphrase uh, of Bill Barr, I mean, I could say it was a BS mission, right? But this is exactly the kind of thing that you have a first-hand witness in B.J. Pack and also uh, in some other witnesses that we heard from. But B.J. Pack, to me, was the most interesting witness of the day. He came later in the morning. Yamish, this also feels like the beginning of kind of the methodical process of the committee to lay out the president as someone who kind of built a, a real proper conspiracy, right? I feel like today was sort of about establishing, for lack of a better way to describe it, just him as a sore loser and surrounded by people who were like, dude, it's over. You lost. There's nowhere else for you to go. Joe Biden won. Let this go. And then in the days to come, presumably the committee is going to tie it to more of an active conspiracy. That at least felt like what, what the path was from today's hearing. Well, today's hearing was, as you said, about making sure that people understood how um, this lie metastasized and became uh, deadly and ended up on the front steps of the Capitol and then has continued um, really, they would say, endangering our democracy. Um, you heard 
a number of people say that President Trump, before any ballots were even cast, was nervous about it, was cautious about it, was, was trying to really plant seeds of distrust. But then when he found out he lost, he couldn't take that. And as a result, he continued to lie, and it got bigger and bigger and snowballed. And then he was fundraising off of it. And then it became this thing that he could not give up. And even as he was getting more isolated, the lie was resilient, and it was growing, and it was, go and it was getting into other people's minds. So what we saw here really is lawmakers trying to build the case that um, what I am talking to my sources, they tell me that this is really about showing that President Trump, former President Trump, had intent, that he knew he was lying, that he understood and should have known better, and as a result, that he was doing this because he wanted to grift and also because he wanted to simply unlawfully hold on to power. I think the big question with regard to what you brought up, Yamish, has to do with how we handle the president's intent and then what the response is to that. Before I ask you about the politics of that, let me ask you, Danny, about the legal piece of that. It feels like just from a legal standpoint, this partly has to do with sort of the difference between fraud and negligence, right? Were you just kind of a screw up who didn't want to deal with the information or did you know you were doing something that was almost maliciously false? They, we heard from Attorney General Merrick Garland today when he was asked about the hearings, and here's part of what the Attorney General said. Watch. I am uh, watching, and I will be watching all of the hearings, although I may not be able to watch all of it live, uh, but I'll be sure that I'll be watching all of it, and I can assure you that uh, the January 6th prosecutors are watching all the hearings as well. So it feels like there is the possibility of something potentially legally in terms of whether it was fraud, whether it was negligent, whether it was conspiratorial, but the Justice Department's also in kind of a weird place. We've never done this with a president before. Josh, you always separate the wheat from the chaff, and you did it again. This really <laughs> comes down to uh, a simple distinction, stupid or criminal, and that's really all this is about. And you could argue that there is an audience of one. Yes, this was for the American public, but it was for Merrick Garland, the gentleman you just saw on your screen. It was a parade for him and him alone because he has that decision to make. In the criminal context, not only does Donald Trump know what he's doing is wrong, you don't necessarily need that. In criminal law, we have a concept called willful blindness. And you can have the truth in front of you and stick your head in the sand like an ostrich. And if you do that, that can be just as bad as doing a crime intentionally. And can we just be clear, before I come back to you, Misha, at least for people who are watching from around the world and may not know the ins and outs of our system, we're talking about the Justice Department, their FBI investigations, there may be a DHS piece to this because this had to do with an attack on the Capitol. Who knows if state lawmakers are gonna say, oh, there might be somebody in our state or a bar association who says that attorney lied to us and now their, their license is in trouble. Sure. So there are many layers, it seems like, of where this could go in terms of repercussions to people that aren't all just the federal government. This could end up being bigger than that. So many layers, and it could be said that this committee's proceeding here really won't lead to any legal repercussions except maybe creation of legislation. But even if they recommend criminal charges to the DOJ, the DOJ is an independent branch. In fact, it safeguards its independence. It will refuse to charge a crime if the DOJ or the, whoever the boss is doesn't feel that there's enough. They're supposed to believe they have enough to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And I just want to say that's another point, too. It's really easy for someone like me to come up here or a former prosecutor and say, well, I looked at the code and this fits all the elements. Right. But U.S. attorneys are career-minded, successful people. It's one thing for me to get it on here, air here and say it, and another thing for someone to stake their career and their job on a potentially failed prosecution of the biggest defendant in the history of defendants. Yamish, before we go, the chairman of the committee, Benny Thompson, and Zoe Lofgren of California, who led much of the questioning today, responded to a question about whether or not the DOJ should go after the former president. Here's what they said. Watch. What is your personal opinion? Do you think that Donald Trump committed a crime and would you prefer that the Justice Department investigated him or even indicted him? Well, I prefer that we complete our work and share that work with the Department of Justice and uh, they will make that call after that. They're the prosecutors, not the legislators. But you feel like you have added... They're the prosecutors, not the legislators. Yamish, before we go, what do these legislators want to see come out of this? Obviously, it's going to vary depending on whether you're speaking to Democrats or Republicans, but after these hearings are over on Capitol Hill, what then? Well, Chairman Thompson has also said that 
that he and the committee is not, are not going to make any sort of criminal referrals to the Department of Justice. He said that in the last few hours here. Um, and that's really him saying, and he said this as well, that the Department of Justice's job is to look at this and decide if there are going to be prosecutions. Their job, he says, is to lay out all of the materials, to provide all of the documents, all of the different testimonies, and then to allow the Department of Justice to make up their minds. The other thing that's happening is that there are some lawmakers who have told NBC News that they also hope that some legislative changes come Come from this, that the American people and lawmakers look at all of the things that happened leading up to January 6th and after January 6th and say, well, can there be things that we can change in our system that will impact this? One last thing, of course, there is the politics of this, and that is um, very, very hard and very, very, I should say, weighing very heavily on lawmakers' minds because their predecessor, former President Trump, he was someone who was very much criticized as trying to politicize the Department of Justice, and the Biden administration has been very clear that they don't want to do that, that they don't want to be seen as pressuring Merrick Garland or the DOJ to take any sort of charges and make any sort of charges against former President Trump. Um, so that is something that is absolutely in the, in the hands of the DOJ, even though today we saw a 12-page statement from former President Trump um, laying out all of his grievances. So that tells me, as someone who's covered President Trump for a long time, that he is someone who is stewing and watching this and also maybe a little worried about the fact that all of the, these people, people that were very, very close to him, are detailing all of the different ways that he lied and all of the different ways that he made may or may not have broken the law. NBC's Jimmy Shalcinder in Washington and Danny Savalos here with us in New York. Appreciate you both being here. And remember, you can continue to watch coverage of the January 6th hearings right here on NBC News Now. Still to come, Congress might just do something about gun violence after all. A group of bipartisan senators says a deal is coming together. What's in it? And what are its chances of becoming law? I'm pleased to say that I believe the principles that we came up with will save lives. So many mass shootings, so many calls for change, so many letdowns in Congress. Will this time be different? The push for new gun laws might have some momentum this time. This weekend, a bipartisan group of senators announced the main points of a tentative deal. It still has to be drafted into an actual bill, but Congress has not passed any landmark gun restrictions in nearly three decades. Meanwhile, the attorney general says the Department of Justice is taking on gun violence, especially gun trafficking. We are cracking down on the criminal gun trafficking pipelines that flood our communities with illegal drugs. We have set up strike forces to disrupt those networks from start to finish, from wherever illegal guns originate to wherever they are used to commit violent crimes. And we have instructed our federal prosecutors and law enforcement agents to prioritize prosecutions of those who are responsible for the greatest gun violence. Joining us now is Chris Brown. She's the president of Brady, an advocacy group focused on ending gun violence. Ms. Brown, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. Good to be here. So let's take a look at some of the items that are within this framework, including an array of things that some folks have been asking for for a while, like enhanced background checks, more incentives for states to implement red flag laws to call out people who may present a danger of gun violence, more school safety funding, mental health funding, addressing the so-called boyfriend loophole that can make it harder to catch domestic violence or relationship status as a red flag, and penalties for straw purchases of weapons, basically getting around the background check system. What do you make of this framework, at least as it stands so far? You know, it's not everything that we would want, but I think it is a remarkably broad set of parameters. And for us, looking at what we see coming out of the United States Senate, what is most remarkable is we have 10 Republican senators, the vast majority of whom are A-rated from the NRA, joining together with 10 Democratic senators, the vast majority of whom are F-rated from the NRA, putting a package together that acknowledges something that hasn't really been acknowledged by this body in 30 years since Jim and Sarah Brady enacted the Brady Law, which is firearms actually have something to do with gun violence in this country. And if you look at the details of that package, Joshua, it does recognize that. And in some areas, we as a movement have been pushing steadfastly for for some time now, these enhanced background checks, 
um, the enhanced incentives for the states around extreme risk or red flag laws, that's really important. That funding is crucial to ensure that red flag laws actually get enacted. The boyfriend loophole, we've been pushing that for so long. It just means that an abuser who is abusing someone and potentially threaten their, threatening their life with a gun who may not be married to that person, that they actually have their firearms removed, just like someone who is married to the person they're abusing, and so much more, including the penalties for straw purchases. So these are important steps forward. It's not everything, but it is an important step forward. Let me ask you about some of the things that did not make it into this framework. And again, this is still just a framework. We haven't seen actual drafted legislation, but we got a statement from these lawmakers that say these are the things we're considering, and that is why we are going with these lists. This doesn't include a ban on semi-automatic weapons. It doesn't ban high-capacity magazines. It doesn't set a minimum age to buy AR-15-style rifles at 21. And there is no universal background check provision in the framework so far. I wonder how you feel about that, considering that, you know, I'm sure there are other things you would have liked to see in this, but how do the items that are not in this framework affect your support for it? You know, I will always push for more because gun violence in America is an epidemic and it's a uniquely American epidemic. We have to tackle this holistically. So I would like to see a lot more than what we see here. I also don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And legislation, especially in the Senate, the United States Senate that we have today to move forward with 60 votes means that you have to have 10 Republicans who are signing off on the legislation. And given that, and given the hurdles that other really important measures have faced, I think it's important for the gun violence prevention movement to understand it is historic to have 10 Republican senators signing off on what is not just tiny uh, breadcrumbs. These are really actually important measures that will save lives. My parameter always, Joshua, is are these things meaningfully, appreciably, if implemented, capable of saving lives from preventable gun violence? And the an answer to that looking at these measures either individually or collectively is 100% yes. And so I feel really good about what we have. I want to make sure we have the right kind of language absolutely to reflect this framework that is endorsed and passed by the United States Senate, then the House right. and signed into law. And you can bet that we are focused on that at Brady. Let me ask you about the mental health side of this. David Hogg, who is a gun violence prevention activist, one of the students who was at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, the day that it was targeted by violence. Here's what he had to say about the mental health aspect of this. Watch. I think the thing that I like about this bill as well, or the, the agreement that they seem to have come to, is that it doesn't just focus on the how of somebody, of how somebody gets a gun, but the why they pick it up to in the first place by focusing on things like, you know, funding mental health, which is needed more, because um, mm -hmm. two-thirds of gun deaths are sides. But I am i don't want to see this bill uh, um, with the mental health aspect stigmatize mental health more. Now, contrast what he said with what we heard from the Texas Democratic Party. They were responding to school safety proposals in that state. This is a different set of proposals than what we're talking about here, just to be clear. But in response to the set of proposals in Texas, the Texas Democrats wrote in part, quote, the fact of the matter is that guns are the issue. Yes, we need more mental health support and our schools need to be properly upgraded, but those are distractions from the issue at hand, that an 18-year-old was able to legally purchase a weapon of war and use it to slaughter a classroom of children and teachers, unquote. That's a statement from Texas Democrats. Chris Brown, what about that? The balance between mental health, which seems to be something that both parties can coalesce around, versus just the fact that you can still, for a crime of passion, in a fit of rage, in many states, say, sell me a weapon of war, they'll do it, and you can kill that day. Look, absolutely, and I agree with the Texas Democrats. I also agree with David Hogg. We have no more mental health, no more diagnosable mental health uh, issues in America today than any other industrialized country. What we have a lot more of is gun violence, gun death, and gun injury. Yet, 
we have an American political system that requires in the United States Senate that we have 60 votes to pass the filibuster. And so if what it takes is a combination of unprecedented increased investment in mental health treatment coming off one of the worst uh, pandemics that we have experienced in this country in combination with an increased investment in common sense gun safety, then I will say absolutely as a, an advocate for gun safety and gun violence prevention, I support that. And as an American, I strongly believe we need a better investment in mental health treatment, but the two things aren't linked. Um, they may be linked in this bill, and I'm glad yeah. to see that folks are recognizing the importance of investment in the right things, and this bill does that. But to be sure, uh, folks with a diagnosable mental illness in this country are much more likely to be the victim of gun violence than perpetrators. That's important to note. Chris Brown from Brady, I appreciate you talking through this framework for us again. And again, this is just a framework, but we appreciate getting your early read on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, Pride and the Prejudiced. Some far-right groups are targeting LGBTQ Pride Month events. Police may have prevented an attack in Idaho. We'll explore who these groups are and how to keep Pride safe. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. They were all dressed like a small army. That is how authorities in Idaho describe dozens of men affiliated with a white nationalist group. Officials say the group had planned to riot at a pride event this weekend. On Saturday, police arrested 31 men in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, near the border with Washington State. A tip led officers to pull over a U-Haul with the men in the back. The group's members came from as far away as Texas, Illinois, and Virginia. They face misdemeanor charges of conspiracy to riot. This is LGBTQ Pride Month, and a number of events have already been disrupted or targeted. A hate crime investigation in California is underway after a group disrupted a drag queen story hour. A town in North Carolina canceled a similar event because of violent threats there. And last week, a 17-year-old in Canada was arrested for threatening a mass shooting at the Pride event in West Palm Beach, Florida, my hometown. Yesterday marked six years since the shooting at Pulse, a gay nightclub in Orlando. A man armed with an assault rifle killed 49 people and injured dozens of others. He was eventually killed by police. Yesterday, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at D.C. Pride in Washington. No one should fear going to a Pride celebration because of a white supremacist. No one should fear loving who they love. Joining us now is Scott McCoy. He is the interim deputy legal director of LGBTQ rights at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Mr. McCoy, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So this group that these men are allegedly connected to, Patriot Front, tell us about this group. What is Patriot Front? Yeah, Patriot Front is a white nationalist hate group that formed in the aftermath of the uh, Unite the Right rally from Charlottesville in 2017. Um, this group had been, uh, well, they, they broke off from a group called Vanguard America which was a neo-Nazi group that also participated in the chaos that happened in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. So uh, it, they are a relatively new group. Uh, in 2018, they had 16 chapters, and that has increased to 2021, having 43 chapters. Um, but they are uh, white supremacists, neo-Nazi uh, people who believe in replacement theory and who want to return this nation to one that is uh, consistent with its original white European uh, ancestry, and they want to reclaim America back to a day where it was supposedly racially pure, and, you know, this imagination uh, land that, uh, that they claim uh, was our country at its founding. 
we should be clear that our country at its founding in many states had a majority black population because many of the states were slave states, where slaves outnumbered their owners. And this replacement theory that says that people of color are slowly being infused into the country to replace white people is false. That's just a public service announcement. But part of what Without Patriot down, Front engages in is, is kind of different from the Unite the Right rally, right? Because the Unite the Right rally, we, we knew that was happening. That was planned. It grew out of control. But it seems like Patriot Front is much more involved in these kind of like flash demonstrations that just sort of pop up out of nowhere, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, they, they take a little bit of a different approach. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, flash mob, white nationalism. Um, they also are, are heavily involved in um, uh, flyering. Uh, in other words, they will uh, make flyers or, or, or leaflets and they will go into a neighborhood or a community and they will like mass drop them around. There were they've also, though, been involved in, in several acts of property destruction. Um, we did an investigation. Our hate watch did an investigation and found 29 different acts of property destruction in 2021. And those range from anything from murals and memorials that celebrate black life, uh, George Floyd, LGBTQ pride, or, or that memorialize the victims of racist violence. So um, they, they are uh, engaging in a, in a kind of a soft uh, uh, violence, if you will, uh, mostly against property right now. But this, I think, this is, is, a, is a demonstration that even though they may look like that they are uh, not, uh, you know, engaging in violence. What we saw here looks clearly to me, very frighteningly, as uh, the next level up. Uh, and their purpose here, it looks like, uh, was to to perhaps do uh, more violence to to individuals and not just property, and to actually riot, which we should be absolutely concerned about. I feel on, on one hand like we need to remember that pride did not begin as a celebration. It began as a demonstration. What we now call gay pride was originally gay liberation in June of 1970, a year after the Stonewall riot. So we literally have these celebrations as a reminder that, you know, we LGBTQ people know how to defend ourselves when we're pushed. But I wonder what you see in terms of whether or not this will actually turn into actual violence. A lot of these groups who have come after the community are kind of, you know, a, a lot of talk and not a lot of walk. They don't actually attack, they're just there to intimidate. How concerned are you that this would grow beyond intimidation and that there would be some way to deal with these groups if it did go that far? Well, I think we always need to be vigilant. Um, you know, we we know that this can turn into violence because we have, in your opening, you mentioned the pulse shooting. Uh, and, you know, it may be in this instance, we, we, we were fortunate in that we caught this, law enforcement caught this uh, before it could erupt into violence. We also saw violence at the Unite the Right rally. So, I, I think that, that these groups are very much capable of violence, and that's why we have to be ever vigilant. Um, and, and fortunately, members of the community in, in Kerr Lane, you know, were, were watching and, and were able to help law enforcement intervene. I don't want to panic right. anyone, but at the same time, we need to keep our guard up. We need to remember that these groups are out there. And, and the other thing I want to you know, say is, is that, you know, mass Patriot Front members arriving in Idaho from around the country isn't just a story about marginal white nationalists, some marginal white nationalist group that hides their faces. This story is about a broader sweeping demonization of LGBTQ people and communities across the country. And I think that these actions, these people are being emboldened when they see le state legislatures all across this country enacting legislation and using rhetoric that is is so uh you know horrible against lgbtq people they see this as a green light to charge ahead and and, and potentially commit violence against our community and, and it's just not acceptable and we really have to be careful scott mccoy of the southern poverty law center appreciate you making time for us tonight thank you very much thank you for covering this there are plenty more Pride events this month in cities around the world and more events year-round. Pride events are not just in June, after all. But with everything going on, and with the recent laws that Mr. McCoy mentioned targeting the LGBTQ community, we want to hear from you. 
What's most important to you this Pride Month? How are you acting on that? Does it still feel festive? Are you leaning more into demonstrations than celebrations? Or do you just plan to stay home this time around? Let us know. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. What's most important to you this Pride Month? You can also email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. We will share some of your stories and thoughts very soon. Tonight's headlines begin with COVID vaccines. 18 million people are still ineligible for the vaccine, but that could change soon. The FDA says Pfizer's vaccine appears to be safe and effective for kids under five years old. About a week ago, it said the same for Moderna's vaccine, which is for kids under the age of six. Now, if those vaccines get approved, Pfizer's would be given in a three-shot series. It's about 80% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19, but that could change as the study continues. Meanwhile, Moderna's vaccine would be a two-dose series. It was about 40 to 50 percent effective at preventing milder infections in young children. And to be clear, the companies tested these vaccines at different stages in the pandemic. This Wednesday, an independent FDA panel of experts will debate and vote on both vaccines. Infant vaccinations could begin as soon as next week. In Ukraine, Russian forces control most of the key city of Severodonetsk. One Ukrainian official described the scene there as high-intensity hostilities. The regional governor said all bridges to the city have been destroyed, making it impossible to evacuate civilians. Some reports claim that hundreds of civilians, including children, are trapped at a chemical plant. A Ukrainian official says the plant is being attacked by large-caliber enemy artillery. We have not been able to independently verify those figures, but NBC's Ali Aruzi has more on what we do know from Kyiv. Hey, Ali. Hey, Joshua. Well, as you know, the Luhansk region is the industrial heartland of Ukraine, and the Russians are burning it to the ground. The focus of their attacks for the last several weeks have been the Eastern Front, and they've concentrated most of their firepower on Severodonetsk, which is the capital of the Luhansk area, and its twin town on the other side of the riverbank, uh, Lysyshansk. All day and night, they're pounding that area with artillery. There are street fights going on, block by block, sometimes house by house. And it's the battle for those two towns that is shaping this war. And that's why there is such serious fighting going on there, because it's such a pivotal place for both sides to control. Now, over the weekend, Joshua, the Russians hit two bridges in Severodonetsk, which connects it to Lysyshanks. And today, they destroyed the third and last bridge, which connects uh, those cities, which means Severodonetsk is essentially now cut off from the rest of Ukraine. That means the Ukrainian military can't get ammunition and forces in there, and any civilians that are trapped in there can't get out, making it a very desperate situation for them. Uh, the military governor of uh, Severodonetsk, Sergei Hadai, said that the next few days is going to be crucial for determining the outcome of this war. And of course, if the uh, Russians are able to capture Severodonetsk, and then Lysyshanks, which is a town on the hill, uh, the rest of the terrain in this country becomes very flat until Kyiv, and that would give the Russians a pretty easy run to move westward, to maneuver their tanks and their troops. Uh, so that's why the Ukrainians are holding off as hard as they can. Um, on Wednesday, there's going to be a meeting of defense ministers from around the world in Brussels to discuss Ukraine, and very high on their agenda is going to be weapons. The Ukraine Ukrainians are saying that they are running out of ammo, uh, that they don't have shells, that they're outgunned by the Russians. They say for every unit of uh, artillery the Ukrainians have, they say the Russians have 10 or 15. And it's just hard to fight the sheer mass of the Russian forces that are advancing towards them. They are asking uh, not just for artillery, but for air defense systems as well. Things like the Israeli Iron Dome or the U.S. Patriot batteries to stave off uh, the Russian onslaught. They're saying that if they
they don't get these kind of systems, they just simply can't match the parity of Russian power. Uh, and they are asking questions. And a, a Ukrainian commander just asked the other day, says, why are, they, why are we getting our weapons in doses, which is barely enough to allow ourselves to defend ourselves and not to win this war. So Wednesday's meeting in Brussels is going to be crucial to see how many weapons they can give the Ukrainians. But of course, the West is lo running low on supplies as well. Just to put it in numbers for you, the U.S. produces about six to 800 Javelin missiles every year, which have been key to staving off uh, Russian tanks. So far since the beginning of this conflict, they've given the Ukrainians five and a half thousand Javelins. So if you do the math, you see that the U.S. has to seriously ramp up production uh, to meet Ukrainian demand. And the U.S. has a huge artillery. You can imagine what the pressure is on much smaller countries that are neighboring Ukraine. Joshua? I can imagine it indeed. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC's Ali Aruzi with the latest for us from Kyiv. Is a recession on the way? The growing consensus seems to be yes, though perhaps not right away. But the stock markets are feeling it right now. The Dow was down nearly 900 points today. The Nasdaq was down nearly 5%. The S&P 500 closed in bear market territory. That means that it's down 20% from its recent high in January. Now, bear markets are not common, but they're not unheard of. There have been 14 of them on a closing basis since World War II. An average bear market lasts almost 19 months. The longest one lasted just over five years. Today's markets are reacting to how the Federal Reserve is dealing with inflation. The Fed is expected to raise interest rates again this week. This weekend, Alaska held a first-of-its-kind primary election. Three candidates are advancing in the state's special house race. Former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin, fellow Republican Nick Begich, and nonpartisan candidate Al Gross. They're running to succeed Congressman Don Young, who died in March. Congressman Young held this seat since 1973. This was the first time Alaska had open primaries and used a ranked-choice voting system. Under this system, the top four candidates will advance to a special election in August. Now, we still don't know who's going to get that fourth spot. Forty-eight candidates were in the running. Forty-eight. And among them was North Pole City Council member Santa Claus. I am so not kidding. That is his real name. Show that man some respect. He got four and a half percent of the votes. Let's dig into this race now with Nathaniel Herz, a politics reporter for the Anchorage Daily Journal. Mr. Herz, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. I, I have to uh, good-naturedly correct you and say it's the Anchorage Daily News. I beg your pardon. Did I not say Anchorage Daily News? I'm, I'm sorry. The Anchorage Daily News. Sorry, sir. With regard to this race, though, I, I don't want people to fixate on just the Santa Claus piece because this is a significant House seat for a member who had held it for a very, very long time, the longest-serving Republican in U.S. House history. What were some of the big issues that were on voters' minds as they went to the polls? Man, I mean, I wish I could tell you this was a very policy focused and stayed and serious campaign, but uh, it was 48 candidates. So really, it was like a lot of candidates running ads saying, here is who I am. This is my elected experience, business experience. You know, there was very little in the way of substantive policy debate, you know, also because uh, this was totally unexpected. Uh, Don Young, the the incumbent, died very suddenly. So there really was very little in the way of like uh, organized high profile debates. Um, you know, you saw Sarah Palin, uh, the former governor, getting to the race immediately announcing an endorsement from Donald Trump. Uh, you had the other leading Republican in the race, Nick Begich, just really kind of touting his his business experience and, and not really necessarily saying that he had a lot of substantive policy differences from from Sarah Palin. Uh, you had an independent, uh, Al Gross, getting into the race, and, and he's really kind of focused on his uh, own personal history as an orthopedic surgeon and, and healthcare expert. And then, you know, this whole mess of people running, uh, 40, 45 more of them, ranging from, you know, businessmen to city council type folks to elected representatives to, as you said, Santa Claus, who had a very, Santa Claus may have had the most policy centric campaign. He basically, uh, is a Bernie Sanders acolyte who said, you know, I'm for Medicare for all. I'm for gay and trans rights. 
Uh, and anything that's not explicitly out of my mouth, go look at Bernie Sanders' platform. So he got, you know, I think he got some novelty votes, but I think he also got some very serious progressive votes because he was one of the, uh, you know, clearest progressives in, in this election. I think everyone kind of, for understandable reasons, zeroed on, on, Sa on Sarah Palin. She got about 29.8% of the vote, was that more about her name recognition? She was the governor of Alaska after all in the past. Was that more about her platform, the Trump endorsement? What's the read on her performance in this primary? I mean, look, we don't have a huge robust exit polling infrastructure in Alaska. I mean, some of the things folks have discussed a lot is, you know, Sir Palin, clearly a really polarizing figure here and outside as we refer to it. I mean, she alienated a lot of Alaskans. I think it's fair to say when she resigned her position as governor in, in 2009. And so, you know, when she was governor, she actually enjoyed a, a really broad cross-section of, of support. Like progressives really liked Sarah Palin. Democrats really liked Sarah Palin. She was an anti-Republican establishment, um, sort of somewhat uh, rogue elected official. Um, but I think since then, you know, she's really accumulated some negatives, particularly with folks on the left and then also with folks on, on the right who were not big Donald Trump fans. So, you know, our understanding from the reporting that we've done and from talking with folks is, you know, about half of the voter rolls have turned over since Sarah Palin was governor. There are a lot of people with, you know, short memories who are not that engaged in politics who just, you know, know Sarah Palin's national profile, also knew that she right. was endorsed by Trump. Uh, and so, you know, that was enough to get her 30 percent of the vote. I think the interesting question is, is there enough support for her to get her, you know, 50 percent plus one, especially in this new ranked choice system of voting? And, you know, clearly we don't we don't have that answer yet, but it's a really interesting question that we're looking forward to getting a better sense of over the next few months. And very briefly, before I have to let you go, what's the good money in terms of how that fourth seat is going to be decided. I'm sure Santa Claus is going to get his share of attention, but how is that expected to go, briefly? Yeah, I mean, Democrat uh, Mary Peltola, who would be Alaska's first uh, indigenous member of Congress, uh, has a, a significant lead by a couple thousand votes right now, but there are uh, about at least 30,000 votes left to count. There's another Alaska Native uh, candidate, Tara Sweeney, who's a former Trump administration appointee and Alaska Native leader who could come from behind uh, Santa's, you know, striking distance. Uh, and then another Democrat uh, member of the Anchorage City Council, the assembly here, Christopher Constant, also could be in striking distance. There have been some kind of demographic uh, distortions in how the early yeah. votes were counted. So, you know, it's possible that we right, see right. a change, but hard to say. Nathaniel Hers of the Anchorage Daily News. Apologies for getting it wrong the first time, but we appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you for making time for us. Remember to send us your stories about Pride Month, what's most important to you right now, and how you're acting on that. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail or send us an email. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.